When choosing homes, we tend to focus on location, price, square meter, and appearance. What if I told you that many homes and apartments come with design flaws that can seriously impact your quality of life over time? I'll be using information from the field of architecture, interior design, and psychology to understand what these design flaws are, how it affects us, and what we can do about it. Whether you're a homeowner, renter, or someone that's just interested in good quality design, take a moment to watch this video so you can make sure you find the perfect home that's just for you. Hi guys, I'm Bai Xu. I graduated from Cambridge University a few years ago as an architect, and now I specialize in beautiful residential design. On this YouTube channel, I share all the design knowledge I know so we can make our homes really, really nice. So I hope you'll stick around. Many homes today are designed with rooms that only receive light from one side, and this is not ideal. When given the option, human beings tend to gravitate towards rooms that are lit from both sides, rather than just from the one side. Rooms like this have light that appears natural, soft, ambient, and everyone looks good in it and feels good in it. Rooms like this, on the other hand, have light that is a lot stronger, and this strong contrast feels a lot more unnatural for us. If you don't believe me, go take a walk around some public buildings or other people apartments and see how you feel when you're in rooms that are lit from multiple sides versus rooms that are only lit from one side. Because I understand the importance of this rule, when I was searching for my own apartment to purchase, I had to eliminate so many listings because I knew if the living space didn't get light from a lot of different windows, I would probably not use the room very well and I will always feel a little bit sad when I'm in there. So if you only take away one thing from this video, let it be this. Make sure you live in a home where the main space, the living room, or whichever room that you tend to spend the most of your time in during the day is lit from at least two sides. Windows are a crucial part of the home. We love to sit next to windows, not just because of the amount of light that we can get, but also because of the visual connection to the outside. And then the thing is, the visual connection to the outside is most meaningful when you can see the ground and the horizon. Unfortunately, many homes nowadays tend to build windowsills that are much too high. And this can be a bit frustrating because the only way you get that meaningful visual connection is by just standing up. What about windows that go all the way down to the floor like a lot of very flashy new buildings have? Also kind of problematic in some ways because having glass that extends all the way down to the floor can feel just a little bit unsettling. It feels more like a door giving the impression that you should walk through it. Most windows nowadays are built around 60 to 90 centimeters above the ground. So then, what is the right height for a window? Well, this depends on which floor level you are at. So the ideal height for a ground floor windowsill is around 35 centimeters from the floor. And the height for a first floor windowsill is around 30 centimeters. And for any levels above that, go for around 50 centimeters from the floor level. Think of these old Dutch canal houses with these huge windows that you can see out of. Or think of these houses with protruding windows and a seat on this sill. Doesn't it feel like a very pleasant environment to be sitting next to, as opposed to a modern home where you push a desk against a windowsill and you only see a little bit of the sky but none of the ground. Small balconies may save cost initially in the construction phase, but if they're so small that people don't even use it, they're not even worth having. Narrow balconies where people have to sit in a row facing outwards are just not as comfortable and gets less used than balconies that are six foot deep. Our rule of thumb is that shallow balconies with a depth of less than 120 centimeters are hardly ever used. The difference in the quality of the space between a shallow balcony and a deeper balcony is really significant. So if you're on the lookout for a home with a nice balcony and porch, take a ruler and measure it. Two other features of the balcony that make a difference in the degree to which people will use it, enclosure and its recession into the building. What do I mean by this? Well, it's essentially talking about the privacy and the feeling of safety and enclosure you feel. So among deeper balconies, those with half open enclosures around them like columns, wooden slats, fences and screens make people a lot more comfortable. On a completely cantilever balcony with no overhang, people are forced to sit outside completely in the open feeling detached from the building, which lacks 
privacy and feels psychologically unsafe. Therefore, if you are looking for your new apartment or you're renovating your house or building your own home and you want to create a nice usable balcony, make sure it's deep enough for at least two people to sit. Ensure that there's some sort of privacy around the space so you don't feel so exposed. We all understand the psychological effect of low ceilings on people. It makes us feel cozier, more intimate. And on the other hand, high ceilings are reserved for formal spaces, places where you feel like you have to behave, like in churches, public libraries. But what is the psychological effect on people if the ceiling height in their home never varies. Experts have come to the conclusion that it's not the absolute height of a room that matters, the fact that there is variation in height between rooms within the building. We associate different levels of intimacy with different ceiling heights and choose the appropriate room according to how we feel in that moment and how we want to use the space. For example, if you're having a large gathering of people around for your home, maybe you want to have it in a place where it feels a bit more formal, so then you have a higher ceiling living room or a sitting room with a fireplace and the tallest ceiling and a lot of lights. But after the whole thing is over and it's just you and your partner left at home, maybe then you would want to take it to a more intimate space where you can have a glass of wine, sit down and talk about how the day went. All these different heights that we experience in the building are very subtle messages that tells us how we should behave whilst we're in that space. Let's consider these range of spaces as an example of how it should make us feel. A canopy bed, a fireside nook, a high ceiling reception room, a train station. If we want to live in a home that allows us to express our full range of human needs, emotions, functions, where we go from the most public to the most private, we should search and live for homes where there's a slight difference in the height of ceiling spaces. It's not just the ceiling height that dictates how public or private a room feels. The actual function of the room obviously also determines this. I mean, the bedroom will always be a lot more private than the dining room. You can host a dinner party and invite a bunch of strangers, but you wouldn't do the same thing to your bedroom. Well, actually, I don't know. I don't want to judge and I don't want to know. All buildings generally, not just homes, have a gradient that goes from public to private. For example, in an office, you have the coffee and reception area, the actual office and workspaces, and maybe staff rooms. And in a home, the intimacy gradient goes from to the porch, to the entrance, to the hallway, to the living room, dining room, kitchen, study, bedroom. And in a perfect world, in a perfect home, the order in which the rooms are arranged that you move through follow this order. In a bid for efficiency, this is all completely broken. Let's just look at a couple of modern apartment layouts as an example and discuss what is not ideal about them. In this listing, the apartment is brand new. It looks great, great condition. But then let's look at the floor plan. We enter the hallway, the first two rooms that you see and is invited to enter are the two bedrooms. In the ideal world, these rooms would be the last two rooms that you would encounter upon entering this apartment, not the first. In theory, it works well, it's a very efficient use of space. But let's think about it practically. And if at the end of a long night, you're saying goodbye to some friends who came over, you're standing at the entrance, and you have a child who's sleeping in the bedroom that's right next to the most public, and they can hear everything and they get woken up, and then they go to the toilet and the bathroom, while you're still standing around the entrance area with some strangers or your friends saying goodbye or saying hello, it's not ideal. So the whole private and public interaction are now interweaved together when they should be a gradient and should be a lot more separate. So in conclusion, the floor plan works, the square meter is used efficiently, there's not much wasted space, but just from a design perspective, the flow of the rooms is less than ideal and it could be better. Let's now look at a good example. I'm going to use Monica's apartment from friends again. Let's put aside how unrealistic the size of this apartment in Manhattan is and just discuss the intimacy gradient of the space. As you can see, when you enter the room, there is a clearly defined lobby area, a more public dining, kitchen, living area where a lot of people can hang out. And then on a level that's slightly above this is a semi more private space where they have some window seats and a desk that you can sit at to work. And then tucked to the completely opposite side of the entrance area are the two bedrooms. So a lot of homes today, especially apartments, don't really follow the correct procedure for laying out the rooms. But now that you're aware of this, you can make an informed decision next time you're property hunting to check the floor plan out and before you sign anything, make sure you're happy with the order that the rooms are arranged in.
If possible, live in a home where the bedroom faces east. Here are some reasons why. Sun exposure in the morning tells your body to wake up and feel alert, so you can start your day right. It can help you align your rhythm with the natural light cycle, making it easier to wake up naturally and fall asleep at night. And sunlight exposure in the morning has been shown to help suppress the production of melatonin, which is the hormone that promotes sleepiness, and stimulate the production of cortisol, a hormone that increases alertness and energy, so you can have a really great start to your day. When you live in an expensive place where the price and availability of good homes is under serious pressure, it's basically an impossible task to find a home that fulfills all of these criteria. But I think it's still important that we educate ourselves on what is considered good design so we can make the most informed decision about what is acceptable in a home for us, what we're willing to sacrifice and what is a no-go. And I hope this video has managed to do a little bit of that. I have another video where I talk about five reasons why your home might feel a little bit more depressing than it needs to be, so make sure to check it out. Thank you for watching. Bye!